besides this, but I just want to begin with verse 20. I'm going to title the message this morning, Behold, I Stand at the Door. We find a, a beautiful invitation of the Lord here to those whose hearts are open for His fellowship and His communion. Notice with me as we read just this one verse, and then again we'll be reading in chapter 1 and also several verses here. He says here in verse uh, 20, and he's speaking uh, to the church at Laodicea, and he says here, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for this day that You've given us. We thank You for another week. We thank You for Your love and mercy to us. We thank You for Your kindness to Your church. Lord, as we come here this morning, we pray Thy blessings, Thy anointing to be upon the reading of Thy precious Word. And Father, we pray this morning as we look here in this text and we just pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and guide us and lead us. And we pray, Lord, simply that thy will to be done in the service here today. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, we have a beautiful invitation here that I've already mentioned uh, to have communion and fellowship with the Lord. This is written beginning in verse 14. Uh, through the end of this chapter in verse 22. It's written to the church uh, of Laodicea. And uh, we find that as we come here to the book of Revelation, I want to back up into chapter 1. Anytime I come and say anything about these churches, I want to back up and uh, kind of repeat myself just a, a little bit. But notice with me as we come to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, there's many invitations that are given uh, in the Holy Scripture. Uh, in Genesis 7, 1, there's an invitation to safety, uh, Noah and his family. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, and verse 18, there's an invitation to sanctification. Uh, in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, an invitation to service. And then in chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, in verse 17, there's an invitation to salvation. Well, our invitation this morning that we're going to be looking at here in chapter 3 is an invitation to fellowship and communion with the Lord. Now, notice as we come back here, just to give an introduction and, and lay a foundation, notice in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 1, he says here, "...the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass." He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We find here in the very beginning of this book, the book of Revelation, we find that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we're going to find that the very first vision in this book is the glorified, risen Savior in the midst of his churches. And this kind of really sets the... Um, a stage for what is we find in the rest of the book. Notice with me in verse 3 of chapter 1, he said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep the things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So there is a comfort to the God's people, and a blessing here to them, promises and blessings and hope for those who read this book and follow its teachings. But notice in verse 4, he says here in verse 4, he said, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before thy throne. So this book is written by the apostle John and written to the seven churches which are in Asia. Come down with me to verse 9 in chapter 1. He says here in verse 9, so this is written to the seven churches. Yes, it applies to us, but these are seven literal churches in the first century that this letter is written to. It's sort of like the letter Paul 
wrote to Romans or he wrote to the Corinthians or to the Philippians. Uh, this letter is written to the seven churches of Asia. And when we think about it, uh, we see that the narrow application of the book of Revelation, of these letters, they're written to individual churches in Asia Minor. That's the narrow application. The broad application is, is that, uh, that uh, there's things that are given to us here. Uh, we can see the strength and weaknesses of churches, things to embrace and things to avoid. But the broad application is that the things that we see here can apply to any age, to any church and any country. So that would be the broad application. But the narrow application, it is written to seven churches. And there's a lot of people, especially prophecy teachers, that have a tendency to overlook that. But notice now, as we come to verse 9, and again, just laying a foundation here, and we want to see that, um, that Laodicea was God's church. You said, I thought there's problems there. Well, there's been problems in many churches over the years. As a matter of fact, out of these seven, five of them have problems that the Lord has to address. There's only two of them that he really praises and does not rebuke. So notice in verse 9, he said, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patient of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is there uh, in this confined place because that he was a man of God, a preacher, and a lover of God. And so this is why he was in the Isle of Patmos. Notice as we come to verse 10. He said in verse 10, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now he's going to give us the interpretation of the candlesticks in verse 20. But in verse 12, he said, 13 rather, he said, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. He con continues to describe the Lord Jesus Christ in his risen, glorified state and his priestly uh, uh, um, uh, apparel. But notice in verse 7, he, or verse uh, 16, I'm sorry, verse 16, he said, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And then we find in verse 17 and 18, uh, that uh, he speaks again to John. He said in the latter part of verse 17, I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Now come down with me to verse 20. The reason I'm reading these verses, I want you to see that the candlestick of verse 11, or verse 11 and 12, and the stars that are mentioned in verse 16, we find that this has to do with the seven churches. Notice in, in verse 20, he said, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now these are literal angels. An angel is a messenger. Or many believe that these are the pastors of the church. I used to not even go in that direction, but the more I have studied this, I think that is the possibility. But uh, that they are possibly pastors. But anyway, they're referred to here, seven stars or seven angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks 
which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, when we think about this, and I mentioned uh, this text, we didn't turn here, but I mentioned this text three weeks ago when we celebrated 33 years as a local assembly. I mentioned the candlesticks and also the lampstands of the Old Testament. Now, the candlesticks here are bears of light. That's what Christians are to be. That's what Christ was. He was the light of the world in John chapter 8 and verse 12. And we are to be the light of the world in Matthew 5 and in verse 14. Also, the Apostle Paul uh, writes to the church at Philippi, and he said, again, that they are to be the light of the world in Philippians 2, verse 15 and verse uh, 16. So the candlesticks here, I'm going to read in chapter 2 and verse 1. The candlesticks uh, represent the churches. And uh, candlesticks are bearers of light, which signify the work of the church. That's what we're to do. The lampstands of the Old Testament in Exodus 25, verse 31 through 40, they're the most beautiful piece of furniture in the tabernacle. There's no windows in the tabernacle. So that was the only light that the priest had by which to perform their duties. And so that he's using this to illustrate and to show what the church is to be. Notice as we read in Ephesians 2, we'll come back to this chapter in a few moments, but he said in verse 1, he said, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So we see very clearly that Jesus Christ is in the midst of his church. And his church is to be light bearers. And so we have seven churches that Jesus Christ loved. I want to emphasize that. From Ephesus to Laodicea, the Lord Jesus Christ loved these churches, even though he had to deal with certain things uh, with some of them. Now let us go back to uh, chapter 3, and we'll begin our, well, let's go to chapter 22, first of all. Let me read one verse in chapter 22. Now, each uh, message with the churches began with a reference to some attribute of the Lord, and then it is followed by, I know thy works. Now, the Lord uses a different attribute that fits the circumstance and the situation of each one of the church. To each church, he identifies himself, again, in a different way or uh, different words that he used. Two of the churches, as I've already mentioned, received no rebuke, and that was Smyrna and also Philadelphia. Now, notice as we come to Revelation 22, and I want to say this three or four times, at least in the sermon, these are God's churches, even though there were problems in some of the churches. These churches belong to God, and these churches were loved by Christ. This is why he's standing patiently at the door and knocking at the door. And we'll talk about that symbolism in just a few moments. But notice here in Revelation 22... And I'm reading in verse 16. We'll probably come back and close in this chapter later. But notice as this chapter or this letter is coming to a close, he said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So this book is written to the seven churches of Asia, as we refer to today, Asia Minor. Now, notice with me as we come back to our text, and let us begin reading in uh, verse 14. Now, <clears throat> Laodicea was a city near Colossae and Hierapolis, and it was a city of great wealth, and this city was known for its commerce, its Greek culture, it was a place of science and literature and also 
medicine. In other words, this city was well known and it was a wealthy city. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul also had a great love for Laodicea. And I'll read this to you. You don't have to turn there. But in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 1, he said, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them of Laodicea and for as many as I have not seen, which have not rather seen my face in the flesh. Paul had a great love for them. Paul also addressed them, and we spent one whole sermon uh, in our Colossians series, series rather, uh, on Laodicea. But notice what he says in, uh, uh, in chapter 4 of Colossae, verse uh, 13. He said, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are at Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Also, in uh, verse 16, he says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. You say, well, where is that epistle? Well, go back and listen to my sermon that we preach a whole sermon on the, I think we titled it the lost letter of Laodicea or something like that. But now notice now in Revelation chapter 4. And I'm going to work my way down to verse 20, where we started a moment ago. And again, we have a beautiful, a wonderful invitation. Now, if you want to use this verse to lead somebody to the Lord, as well as other verses, I think it's proper and okay. I, if you want to tell somebody that the Lord will knock at our hearts, I believe that is okay. But in the context and it's in the context is so important when we study the Bible. In the context, he's writing this letter to his church, to his people, and he's knocking at the door. He stands and knocks at the door and says, If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me. So technically speaking, or biblically speaking, I should say, he's writing to his church and the invitation is given to the church. Now again, I don't think it's wrong to use this verse in witnessing. I've used it a number of times. I don't think it's wrong at all. Because we know that as he's knocking at the door of this church, basically, He's saying if any man, he's talking about any individual in the church, and again, their hearts must be open unto the Lord uh, in order to have communion with the Lord. So I believe that the verse is, first of all, the narrow uh, interpretation of it is written to believers. You know, but again, I've used it many times to talk to people about the Lord as we use other scripture. So this invitation, we want to begin in verse 14 and look at why the Lord gave this invitation. Again, the Lord Jesus, we're going to see in verse 19, he loved this church. And we also see that the apostle Paul had a great love for this church. This church belonged to God. This church was a candlestick in chapter 1 in verse 13 through 20. Also, Ephesus was a candlestick, like a lampstand of the Old Testament, to bear light in chapter 2 of Revelation in verse 1 we just read. This church was loved and chastened by the Lord. Verse 19, we'll read that in just a moment. This church was called upon to repent also in verse 19. So now notice in verse 14, as we read this, we see here the Lord identifies himself in three different ways to this church. Again, each one of these seven churches and we have a series on these seven churches in 2019. 
And we also have some other sermons centered around him. I got one sermon titled, The Rewards of These Seven Churches. We just looked at the rewards that God offered to each one of them. But notice in verse 14, he says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So we see here the Lord identifies himself in three different ways to this church. Now, again, he does this differently with each one of them. When, for instance, for instance, like in chapter uh, 2 and verse 8, under the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. So uh, it's something uh, different is said each time in reference to the Lord and his character or his attributes. So in verse 14, we find here that the, he has three things here. And the first thing is, he says, these things saith the Amen. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Amen, 2 Corinthians 1.20. He establishes all the purposes of God. Also, he is referred to, secondly, as a faithful and true witness. In other words, he testifies of the truth, as in chapter 1 and verse 5. We know this when we read through the book of John, in John chapter 18, as Jesus stood before Pilate, he came to bear witness of the truth. So he is the amen. We have an entire sermon on that. He is the faithful, wit, uh, faithful and true witness. And then last of all, he's the beginning of the creation of God. There's people who take this verse and say, see, Jesus is the first thing that was created in the universe. And it is not saying that. It's showing us that he is the creator of all things. Hebrews 1, 2 tells us he created all things. And Colossians 1, verse 15 through 18, tells us that he created all things. John chapter 1, verses 1 through about verse 14, two different times we see that he created all things. So this is the way that the Lord opens up the letter. This is a letter. We all love to get letters, don't we? Well, this is a letter to the church. And notice with me now as we come to verse 15. Verses 15 through 17, we actually see the sin of this church. Now, the Lord loves this church, so he's pointing out the sin of this church, and he wants them to uh, correct their problems, and he wants to have fellowship with them, just like he wants to have fellowship with you and I. He loves the church. We're going to see that. Yes, he rebukes it. Yes, he chastens it them and whatever, but what father would not chasten his son if he loved his son? And so we find that the Lord loves this church. So uh, we've seen churches by the name of Philadelphia and, uh, you know, a lot, you know, people that named their church. I've never heard one named Laodicean Baptist Church. There could be one, but I've just not heard one up until this time, and I'm 70 years old. Now, what was their problem? I'm going to give you one word. Now, I'm going to say more than that, but one word describes their problem here in our text as we read verses 15 through 17, and that is lukewarmness. That was the one problem. One sin that they had was lukewarmness. Now, when we, when we read through this, he rebukes the church at Ephesus. We'll come back and look at that in just a moment if we have time. But he also rebukes uh, Pergamos and Thyatira, and there's some doctrinal eras there in those churches. With Ephesus, there was no doctrinal era. It was the fact that they had left their first love. But here we find that it appears that the real problem was lukewarmness. It, this is their sin. It doesn't appear to be a, a doctrinal sin or immorality 
uh, in the church, but seems to be self-sufficiency. In other words, lukewarmness. The spiritual condition, they became heartless and inward problems. Uh, going through the motions of religious activities, but the heart is not in it. So we can learn something from all of these churches. We can learn strengths and weaknesses. We can learn things of what to do and not to do. And so there's, there's some great things here. Literal churches existed in the first century. The Lord is in the midst of them. He loves them. He's writing to them. He wants fellowship with them. And so we can learn great things from them. Now notice here, I want to read verses 15 through 17. We see the problem. From verse 18 through 22, he gives the invitation. The invitation is a little bit longer in verse 20, but we started with verse 20. But notice as we come reading um, from verse 15 through verse uh, 17, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Then we see the invitation beginning in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me, and he continues with a list of things here. So we see here the lukewarmness. That's what he called them. They're lukewarm. It doesn't necessarily say that there's some great doctrinal era or that there's immorality as we would find maybe with, you know, another church or whatever, but it just seems like that they have become lukewarm. They're neither cold nor hot. In other words, if the Holy Spirit would, would walk out of many churches in America today, most of them wouldn't even know that he left. And this is the problem that this church was coming to. Now notice, first of all, in verse 15, he first thing he says is, I know thy works. In verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So we see here in verse 15, he knows their works, that is their deeds. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows our goals, our ambitions, our loyalties. He knows everything about us individually, but he knows everything about us as a church. There's nothing that can be hid from the Lord. And these are the first words to this church. Now, again, there's two churches that were never rebuked. Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were praised and encouraged to go through the bad things they were going through, the persecution and the problems that they were going through. So the analogy here is cold, hot, and lukewarm. All three of these words are related to their deeds. He uses the waters as analogy of their spiritual conditions, what he's using. And it's, a, it's really a good analogy. And instead of being useful, either hot or cold, they were useless being lukewarm. Now I'm going to, in the last two times I've preached in this text, I think... 2019, I interpret the hot and cold a little bit different than the way I was taught years ago. Because notice in verse 15 again, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Notice, I would thou were cold or hot. The cold represents that which is refreshing, and the hot represents that which is soothing like a hot bath. 
but lukewarm. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's talk about the, the cold and the, and the hot, first of all. Laodicea, their water came through a pipe or an aqueduct uh, from a spring about six miles away and was lukewarm and of little use. Now, that's a historical fact. Colossae had its cold, refreshing mountain springs. Hierapolis had a spring that was hot, medicinal water. And we all know this. Hot water can give us a nice, soothing bath. And uh, it's therapeutic, is it not? It's nice to take a good, warm bath, especially when it's cold. And then the word cold here used in the passage for drinking. Cold water is refreshing. It quenches the thirst. If you're working out in the hot sun, like you were yesterday, working out in the hot sun, you do not want warm water to drink. You want some cool water. So that's, that's what he's saying here. Now notice as we read now in verse 16, he says here in verse 16, he says, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Sounds like some strong words. And still yet the Lord loves this church, and the Lord is wanting fellowship with his people that are in this church. Now notice here the word, the word here, lukewarm, uh, in verse 16. Now keep in mind, I'm, I'm saying that the hot and the cold refers to that which is good. And I think, I think this is the, the analogy used here. I think this is the best way to interpret it. Because he wouldn't wish anyone to be hot or cold if one of those was bad. You know, and... Uh, so, notice he said in verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold, again, which is refreshing, quench the thirst, nor hot, which is soothing and therapeutic, he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, lukewarm is a nauseating state, is what he's saying. It's half-hearted, many synonyms we could use with this, that which is indifferent, complacent, casual, compromised, or we could nowadays use the word cool. You hear that a lot. Are you cool? I remember, I remember years ago somebody asked me, said about someone, just, are they cool? What they meant is, are they living in sin? Do they smoke marijuana? Are they cool? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't, probably can't use that word uh, in, in a different way, but we find here, this reminds me when I read this text of American Christianity. The Lord is saying you're nauseating. You're in a nauseating state, is what he's saying. You're lukewarm, you're half-hearted, you're complacent, you're casual, you're compromised, in other words, I won't have fellowship with you. They were prideful. They were self-satisfied, self-confident, self-sufficient, self-motivated, self-righteous, and worst of all, self-deceived. They deceived them themselves. We're going to see that as we read this. We're going to see what they said and what God said. So we don't have to guess at this. We see what they say. And so, as we read this, he says in verse 16, So then, because that thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, God is basically saying, this makes me sick, I will vomit. Lukewarm water is used sometimes to induce vomiting. And you've heard me say this before, I, I've had people well, if you've got an upset stomach, just get up and drink some more milk. That is, sounds pukey to me. And that would even, that, now that would make me vomit. It might help some people, but it's never helped me in the 70 years I've been on this planet. It would make me sicker. 
2 Corinthians 3, 5 speaks about having a form of godliness, but not having the power. And I'm not quoting that verbatim. In other words, having a form without the power. Notice back with me in chapter 2, I said we'd come back to this. In chapter 2, the, the church at Ephesus, and think about this, think about uh, the letter that Paul wrote, the book of Ephesians, six chapters. He begins that book in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, praising them for their faith and their works. He began, he's praising them. That was a strong church. It was a spiritual church. And I had someone tell me about a year ago, says, well, now the church that Paul wrote to is not the same church that John is writing to. And I said, well, I, I, if you'll show me this in the scripture, I'll believe that. But I said, you have to show me. They couldn't, but they're saying it just don't make sense. But it's the church at Ephesus here John's writing to. And Paul established that church and he wrote a letter to that church. Now, when we read from chapter 2, their doctrine is fine. When you begin reading in chapter 2, verse 1, this church is standing true doctrinally. They, stand, they stood against the Nicolaitans in verse 6. So as far as their doctrine, he praises them for their doctrine. But here is the problem in verse 4 and 5. He says, nevertheless, and every time you hear that, you know something's coming. I love you, man, but nevertheless. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Think about this. This church, doctrine is right, but they've lost their zeal. They've lost their passion, their enthusiasm, their joy, their warmness, their devotions, their affections. They have a lifeless orthodoxy. In other words, the honeymoon was over. Their doctrine is true. They're standing against false doctrine, but there's something wrong with the heart. And here's what he said to the church at Ephesus. He said in verse 5, he said, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So your doctrine is right and you've fallen. And he says, and repent and do the first work or else I will come to thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He said, in other words, I will remove your influence, maybe even remove the church period. Now come back with me to chapter three. And notice with me, as we come to verse 17, and I want you to notice in this verse, this verse summarizes verse 15 and 16. In other words, the lukewarmness. And we see in verse 17 what the church said, and then what God says. There's five statements here that shows the true condition of this church. They are spiritually bankrupt. They said, we have need of nothing, and Christ says, you have nothing. Now notice as we read verse 17. Because thou sayest, so they're given, the Lord has given us their own words. I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. And notice this, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind and naked. They're saying we're rich. Notice back with me in chapter 2 again, this time in verse uh, 8 and 9. He said in verse 8 and 9, Under the angel of the church uh, in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now look at this, I know thy works. Again, he says this to every church. He said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but what's the next four words? But thou art rich. Well, they weren't rich, physically speaking. Uh, they were poor. He said, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So as we come here to chapter 3 with Laodicea, 
one of the first things here is that we see that uh, I, that they saying that we're rich. And uh, he says, but you know it not. In other words, they're physically prosperous and spiritually bankrupt or ignorant. And then there's four words that are described here, and then we're going to get to our invitation. There's uh, uh, five words, actually. The word wretched in verse, um, in verse 17, notice that, wretched. And then the word uh, miserable, notice that, one to be pitied. And then the word uh, poor, in other words, they're poor spiritually. As in 2 Peter 1, 9, uh, Peter tells us, there, he tells us in the context of that, there's seven things that we're to add unto our faith. And those things are virtue and knowledge, and temperance, and patience, and godliness, and brotherly kindness, and charity. And he says in verse 89, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, But he that lacketh these things, speaking to believers, he says is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So there's some things that Laodicea had forgotten. And then the next word that he uses here in chapter 3 and in verse uh, 17 is the word naked. And we find that he sees their lukewarm attitude as shameful nakedness, that needs to be clothed with the garments of righteousness. So, again, we're going to find now, verse 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, his love for this church. He says here in verse 18, speaking to the church of Laodicea, see, this church belonged to God. I want to keep emphasizing this. It belonged to the Lord, and the Lord loved this church, but he's dealing with it. And he says here in verse 18, he said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and he's talking about here spiritually, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. In other words, we find here that he's speaking mainly of spiritual terms here in this passage. And Laodicea was also known for, and I have, I've read this anyway, and so he may obviously be using things that apply to that very city and, that, and the surroundings when he talks about lukewarmness and water and the ISAB and things of that nature. Now, notice with me as we come to verse um, 19. Verse 18, clearly, he says, buy of me. He said, I want you to be rich in faith. Now, notice in verse 19. He said in verse 19, as many as I love. See, this is why I keep saying the Lord loved these churches. And he loved Laodicea. Paul loved Laodicea. So he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So the Lord is rebuking this church, but the Lord loves this church. He wants this church to repent, as we see in this passage. He wants, he wants fellowship with this church. Notice also... He uh, ch uh, is to chasten this church, discipline them. He will not let them go without being corrected. Aren't you glad that the Lord does that for us? We may not like it at the time, but I'm glad that he doesn't let his people just go their own way. He'll, he'll reach out and deal with us if we're truly born again. I've had people ask me, why isn't God dealing with so-and-so? Maybe they don't belong to him. Maybe they just act like they belong to him. Maybe they belong to the devil. Because if we don't belong to God, we belong to the devil. Yes. 
And he also says in verse 19 to be zealous, Titus 2.14, to be zealous of good works. And then he says here in uh, verse 19, the last word, to repent. Again, we found that in chapter 2 and verse 5. You'll find it again with another church in chapter 2 and verse 16. In chapter 2 and verse 22. We find it again in chapter 3, speaking of Sardis in verse 1, 2, and 3. Notice chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast, and repent if therefore thou hast Thou shalt not watch, uh, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So we see the word repent with these seven churches at least four or five times. So verse 19, one more time, and many as I love, I, will, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Now come back with me to verse 20, in verse 20. He says here, and I love this verse. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I love this verse. All of you know what the word behold means. Somebody tell me. Looky here. That's clear in the Greek and the English. So Christ, for whatever reason, again, the lukewarmness would really be the reason, but Christ appears to be shut out of the church and he's desiring fellowship. That's what I get when I read this. And I wonder how many churches that Christ is shut out of today or how many hearts of individuals that Christ is shut out of today. You've heard me tell this a number of times, but many years ago, uh, we used to live close to Tanny Hill. Y'all got to visit there. We used to live close to there, and we used to go there often. And to me, it's one of the greatest state parks in the state of Alabama. And I've told you this story, but I went there, and I went just a few days before my wife and daughter came, and I spent about three, four days, I can't remember, I'm going to say three days. And I went there for a purpose. Of course, we camped for a little while, but I went there for a purpose. And that was to pray and to seek the Lord on some things. And as I would leave the campground and start on the trail, and I went through the trails and got off the trail and climbed the highest point that I could find there, and I would sit there from about 7 in the morning to about 12, 1 o'clock in the day and just pray and read my Bible. But as you came out of the campground and you started into the trail, the reason I love Tiny Hill, let me tell you why, is because I'm from Tennessee and the mountains, and there's, that's where I think the Blue Ridge Mountains come down to start ending there. So it just kind of reminds me of home a little bit. And so I like the hills and mountains. But as you'd come out of the campgrounds and start in to go on the trails around up in the hills, there was a sign there that somebody had put there, and it was Revelation 3.20. So every morning that I'm getting up and I'm going to do this trail and climb this, I'll say a mountain, this wasn't really a big mountain. But anyway, uh, I would stop and just look at this verse and and just read it and over and over and think about it for about five or ten minutes before I would go on on the trail. This verse became very, very important to me. The Bible said in Psalms 46, uh, Be still and know that I am God. His invitation is open here to this church. He's still waiting to be gracious. His tender love is seen to this church. He stands. He stands. He's patient. He stands at the door and he knocks, showing his interest for this church and the people of this church. And notice he says also in verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Knock. 
He said, if any man hear my voice. In other words, the Lord will, will uh, it's like the whosoever's in the Bible. And we find in Luke 12, 37, the Lord will serve his faithful servants. That's an amazing passage. He will serve those who have served him. And he says here, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, notice this, open the door, as in John 14 and in verse 23, this is the way to revive a lukewarm heart. I'm going to read in John 14 and verse 23. We have these words, and this is in the upper room, before the night before the crucifixion. And Jesus answered and said unto him, if, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, speaking of the Trinity, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So we have some amazing thoughts here as we read, read through this. If any man hear my voice, if any man will open the door, again, this is the way to revive a lukewarm heart. We all can easily have a lukewarm heart just because of the things in life that we have to deal with. But notice the next word. He said, I will come to him and sup with him, and he with me. Notice he said, I will come to him, and he with me. But he says, I will come to him, and will sup with him. This speaks of fellowship, and Christ desires to have communion with his people. Amen. That's what we see here. It, this word sup is not a snack. It's a full course meal. And spiritually speaking, it's to dine with him, as in Psalms 23, that he'll prepare a table in the midst of our enemies. The children of Israel had asked in Psalm 78, beginning around verse 19, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And the answer is yes. He gave them manna, he gave them quail, as far as food and things like that. He gave them water out of the rock, but he also offered his fellowship to them. And here in our text, we find, he said, I will come and sup with him. In other words, to dine with him, to have full uh, communion, a full experience with Christ. He's saying that I will do this. Verse 22 says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The question we uh, we are to ask, are we listening to God's Spirit and to God's word. See, that's the question we must ask each of, each of ourselves. Verse 20 again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This thing about supping with the Lord, again, commune with him. And again, if we use it in the physical sense, it's like a full course meal and not just a snack or whatever. We use it as he's using it here in a spiritual sense. It's talking about full communion, the fullness of communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying to this church, those that are, that are in it, those that know him as Savior, uh, and so forth, he's saying that I want your fellowship. So he stands at the door. He's patient, and he's knocking at this door as he's knocking on the hearts of individuals He's wanting fellowship with his people. And I believe that 2,000 years later, the Lord still wants fellowship with his people in his churches around, around, the, around the world. Hebrews 10, says, Let us draw near with a true heart. James 4, 4 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Or to thee, it says. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord in your heart. In other words, let him have his rightful place. I'll give you some verses. We'll not turn to all of these. But in Psalms 42 and verse 2, I think in our Proverbs series, we've read several of these just recently. But speaking of the presence of God, 
Speaking of the presence of God, Psalms 42, 2, Psalms 62, verses 1 and 5. Psalms 63, verses 1 through 8. Psalms 84, verses 2 and 10. And then in Psalms 51, verse 11, David himself wanted the presence of God. He is afraid of losing the presence of God. In Psalms 34 and verse 8, God reveals himself to those who seek him with the whole heart. Paul cried out in Philippians 3, 8, he cried out that I might, that I may know him. Genesis 4, 8, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. We find also in Genesis 28 and verse 16, Jacob, remember Jacob leaving his family and also Esau rather wanting to kill him. And he's leaving the land, he's going to another land for a number of years. And the Lord met with him, let him know he's the God of Abraham and Isaac, his grandfather, his father. And he says, I'm going to give you the land. He went to sleep and God gave him a dream and renewed the promises, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children uh, of Jacob, and so forth, the seed of Jacob. And he renewed uh, the covenant with Jacob. He said, you're going to come back into this land, and your seed one day is going to have this land. Jacob woke up, and he said, God is in this place, and I knew it not. He saw the angels on the ladders coming from heaven to earth. He saw all these things. And he built an altar and he poured oil upon the stones that he had used for, you know, as he slept that night. And he made a vow unto God there that day. In other words, he found communion with the Lord. I've preached twice, at least twice, on the subject of the presence of God. We wrote this article in 2011. And there is the universal presence of God. We understand that God is everywhere. But there's also the indwelling presence of God. In other words, those who are saved and have the Holy Spirit in them, making us the temple of God. But there's also, and this is the one we're talking about now, the manifest presence of God. The three aspects of this thing. And the manifest presence of God, that is, God manifests himself in particular ways at specific times to certain individuals or groups. An example of this, uh, in worship, God is present with us, Matthew eighteen twenty. for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Do you believe that God is in the midst of us this morning? He has made that promise. He's made that promise when we worship together. He's made that promise when we come to the Lord's table. He's made that promise even in decisions that we make in the church that he's promised that he will be with us and he'll be with us individually. I'm going to read a section here that I put in this article uh, about 12 years ago, the reality of God's presence using, uh, using Moses for an example. And... And this here is actually titled, The Experience of God's Presence. This is one paragraph out of it. In Exodus 33, 14 through 15, Moses asked for the presence of God to be with them. As a matter of fact, he wasn't ready to do anything without the presence of God. And this immediately, this is immediately after Israel's sin and rebellion uh, with the golden calf in chapter 32 of Exodus. So you can see why God wanted the presence, why Moses rather wanted the presence of God. Just got through with this sin with the golden calf. And so God spoke to Moses face to face in Exodus 33, 8 through 18, showing God's divine presence in his life. I want you to listen to this. In, in, in verse 13 to 18, there are three things in the text that accompany God's presence. One of them is in verse 13, divine guidance. God has promised when his presence... This, now, this is what we're talking about in Revelation 
is that is that we experience God's manifest presence, that we have communion and fellowship and sup with him. In other words, we have that special relationship with him, not just know him, but as Paul cried out, that I may know him. So one thing that comes along with uh, the presence of God is a divine guidance and as I put in here, which is much needed in a world filled with confusion. The second thing is divine rest in verse 14, which includes peace, harmony, tranquility in a restless and hostile society. And then the third thing is divine glory in verse 18, which was a display of God's majesty and power. Moses' desire to see God's glory was given to him in the two chapters of Exodus 33 and Exodus 34. Moses was not ready to leave or go anywhere or to go to do anything unless God's presence was with them. His manifest presence, not just his universal presence and whatever, but his manifest presence. So as we read this again, let's come back to this text. And let us remember, too, in Revelation 22, 11, there's an invitation to salvation, as I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, message. There is no fellowship with Christ unless first we have the salvation through Christ, through his blood that he shed for us at Calvary. But let us read verse 20 through 22 as we close this morning. And he says here in this passage, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's not just the church, but that's each and every one of us that God said he would do this. And he says here in verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down in my father, with my father, rather, in his throne. In other words, we find here the word overcometh or overcomer is a word that's used for those who have been born again that have victory in Jesus Christ. Verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The church of Laodicea was not listening to the Lord. And so here we find, verse 20, the Lord is standing at the door and he's knocking and he's saying, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And again, I believe the Lord is knocking on the door of many hearts, those that are lost that need to be saved and those that are saved that have a lukewarmness about them that he wants fellowship. This is how much that the Lord loved us, not only going to the cross and dying for us, but he loves us so much that he was in the midst of those seven churches. He was so concerned about those churches, and he's concerned that we have fellowship with him individually and as a church as well, that we experience his presence, his communion, and his fellowship. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we thank thee this day for thy love and mercy and kindness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit of God that dwells within. And it is the spirit that gave us the word. Lord, we know these are in total harmony with one another. And Father, I just pray that as I've been meditating upon this passage this week and the importance of it, I just pray that each and every one of us will have a desire, Lord, uh, to serve you, to be faithful to you, but to also to have communion and fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that we will see the danger of lukewarmness and that we will stay clear of that, not only as individuals, but also as a church body. And Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.